to expect, how to continue to kind of deep dive into all of it. I knew coming into this book, it wasn't just going to be like quick four weeks, kind of like an overview recap of it. Um, I was like, there's way too much in here to, to do just that. I was kind of thinking it would be nine, ten weeks, maybe even more. Um, but if you've missed anything or anything like that, you can always just go back on my YouTube, YouTube page and look at it. This week's title is called A New You, or because Calvin got a snake this week, and um, I'm calling it Shed Your Skin. Shed Your Skin. You know, as we end one year and into the next, this idea of like changing who you are or working on yourself is very, very popular, right? The next four weeks, you're going to hear tons about setting goals and this and that. And I, I love it. It's great. But here's the key to all of that. Here's the key to no matter what new goals are or what you want to become or this or that, the, new, the goal is simply this. The key is to not leave anything behind. It's to not leave anything behind. There was this, oh my goodness, my hands are still sticky. Uh -huh. There was this show in TLC from way back in the day, and I don't even remember, I'm just like vague pieces of it, where they used to take someone's wardrobe, they didn't know how to dress, kind of like me without Tina. Uh -huh. <laughs> like, right? And what they would do is they would come in and they would get rid of their entire wardrobe. And they'd give them all new clothes. And they wouldn't just add a bunch of stuff to the wardrobe. They had to get rid of the entire wardrobe because they knew, they knew that once they left, even if they gave them a whole new wardrobe, like a whole bunch of extra stuff in their wardrobe, that if they didn't get rid of all the old stuff, you would go back to wearing all the old stuff. They knew that you had to get rid of all the old stuff. And the new life of Jesus works the same way. We have to get rid and change our old habits, ways, actions, thoughts, and more. We do this with any kind of goal, anything, right? You have to change what you're doing. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing and expecting different results. And it's the same thing when it comes to Christianity. And so remember, the book of Ephesians, that Paul's writing this to churches. He's writing it to Christians. And it's different back then than it was now. When this was written, you had been going to church would have put you in like the radar of getting arrested. So you are coming to church to try to figure out this whole like Jesus thing. You're like, ah, is it good? Is it bad? I don't really know. About it. It's like you weren't showing up unless you were like in. You're like, I, I, I need this. Because you're not putting your life at risk, your family's life at risk, unless you're in, right? And so Paul is writing to Christians, people who profess the faith in Jesus. So we're going to start in chapter 4 of Ephesians in verse 17. Here's what it says. With the Lord's authority, I say this, no longer live as the Gentiles do. Remember, he went off on the Jews, he went off on the Gentiles. He went off on the Greeks, wherever, like whatever version you read, it's the same. He went off on both groups and said, you can't act this way, you can't act this way. I don't care what you've always done, you're different. I don't care what you've always done, you're different. You're not a Jew, you're a Christian. You're not a Gentile, you're a Christian. It's different. You're different. So he continues with these things. And what he's trying to get them to understand is the Gentiles in that day and age would have worshipped lots of gods. Remember a couple months ago when we were doing a series on different religions? They would have worshipped lots of gods, built lots of shrines to them. And that's what they're... And so he's telling them, you can't do that. You can have one god. You can't have lots. You can have one. So he's calling them to live different. Verses 17b through 19 says this. For they are, for they are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against it. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasures and eagerly practices of every kind of impurity. Now again, remember, this would have been just written out loud to church. Now what Paul is doing is he is describing a pattern of what sin looks like. He is describing a pattern of broken thinking. A pattern of this is what I think is messed up. A wrong lens. And what happens is we can get so consumed with things that everything we see is through a wrong lens. And because of that, they end up making all kinds of choices and decisions that are just wrong. Our brains are our absolute biggest tool and biggest muscle. Our brain, what we think. Good decisions, bad decisions. Godly, wrong ones, right? Because you can make a bad decision and not be sinful. 
You realize that, right? Mm -hmm. Like someone gave me a, I won't say a 24 inch pumpkin pie, but it felt like a 24 inch pumpkin pie, right? I was like, uh, they're like, what do you say you love pumpkin pie? <laughs> right? Could not finish it. Every time I went to eat a piece of pie, literally I was like, oh my gosh, what is wrong with me? Like, right? So I didn't finish it. I'll, I'll admit, did not finish the pumpkin pie, but part of it was really good. Okay? That wasn't necessarily the wisest decision to eat like a quarter of a pie right at 8 o'clock at night. That has nothing to do with sin. That's just not a good decision to make. You're not going to sleep. At least I wouldn't sleep because of all the sugar, right? Like, so you can make good decisions and bad decisions, and that has nothing to do with wrong or godly. But when our thinking is broken, what happens is we realize we are cut off from God. We are separated from God. And here's how you know you're separated from God. You ever have these things? I, I hear people say things like, ah, I don't really feel God's presence. I don't hear his voice. And what happens is the really hard truth is that most likely it's because we are separated from God. Because God wants to talk to us. He wants to speak to us. He wants a personal relationship. So if you don't feel close to somebody in a personal relationship, it means you're not close to that person in a personal relationship. Just in real life, right? In practical like sense. If you don't feel close to somebody, there's a really good chance you're not close to somebody. And it's hard. And here's what's really hard. Because of our mind, because of where it can go, Here's what happens is we end up seeing things about somebody or something, and now we're not seeing things through a proper perspective or a proper lens, and it almost doesn't matter if something's true or not. If we think something about somebody, if we have a preconceived idea about somebody, we're always going to see that person through that lens, no matter what that is. Or even a group of people, even if the reality of that group of people is so far off of what the truth is, we believe it in our minds, and so now we're treating them like such. And here's what oftentimes happens is we hang on to things. We hang on to our past, we hang on to past relationships, past experiences in church world, and even more, and we bring those into the next season of life. And so now, so say you had a really bad experience as a kid or even as an adult in church. Well, guess what? The next time you walk into church, you're going to remember those bad experiences and your idea around Christians is based around that experience that you had with other people who call themselves Christians. Even though it may not be remotely close to what you would be currently experiencing in your head, that's how you're seeing it. You ever been cheated on? If you have, your next relationship, you're going to see things with a level of distrust. Why? Because they broke your trust. And it's hard to get through those things. They're broken. Broken. Separate, man. He called it hard-hearted. Hard-hearted. You get to this point, you don't know. People can get to a point where you no longer care about what's right or wrong. Or we, we have this question a lot and get it a lot. Why do people do what they do? Why is this world so messed up? What's going on in Palestine? What's going on in Gaza and Israel? What about this and what about this? And how can people be so cruel? They pull themselves away from Christ. They're hard hearted. Their hearts are concrete. And it's hard. And here's the deal. Here's what. And because Paul is talking to Christians inside the church, he's telling us that you can be hard hearted and inside the church at the same time. That's scary because inside the church, we wanted to view it as people outside the church. Oh, that's the Hitlers. I didn't mean to do that. Like, right? Like, that's Hitler. Like, those are the really bad people. That's Stalin, that's Hitler, that's just, that's terrorists. That's those people. But Paul's writing to people inside the church. So he's talking to people in the church, and your heart can be hard-hearted. This is how you know you can have people in two, the same church, two different people sitting in the same room, have two completely different ideas and outcomes and thought processes about church. One person in the church, like, oh, the music's too loud, it's too new, I don't know this, I don't know that, we don't have a lot of band, blah, 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 it's not a hymn, I don't know this, somebody did, somebody did it, say hi to me, oh, there are snacks, the church would be for health, because we're trying to build healthy people, so we should help food, I don't know, like, you know what I mean, like, depending on the attitude, you can come up with any kind of, like, reason to be mad about anything, really, you really can, because I can do it too. Okay? We all can. 
Or, depending on the other side of the attitude, you're like, man, I really don't care about all the other stuff. I just want to worship Jesus and have him impact, him impact my life. Maybe build some relationships in the process and all like, oh, that'd be great. Two completely different mindsets, two completely different attitudes. My prayer, that I pray all the time is this, is this, that God would always be softening my heart towards him and people. I pray this on a regular basis. Did it this morning. Lord, make sure that my heart is soft towards people and you. All the time. See, we, our hearts are hardened, and what we try to do is we try to fill them. We try to fill them. God created dopamine, and God created serotonin. He created all those feel good feels. He created them, they're there for a reason. But they do not supplement or replace our relationship with Jesus. They can't and they never will. You can get a rush from shopping and get Amazon boxes. Ooh. <laughs> you, ever, you know you're in a bad place when Amazon is showing up so often you don't even know what's in the box. That's a very scary place. You're like, what did I order? I have no idea. This is going to be fantastic. That's a scary <laughs> place to be. And every lady's like, oh my gosh, that's me. Right? <laughs> it's all right. It's in my house too. I love you, babe. Like, Right? Like, you get to that place, and you're like, man, I felt like that, right? We ordered all this Christmas stuff on, like, Black Friday, right? We just sat there like, like this. Oh, we're going to family in time? Oh. <laughs> right? Because you just order, 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 sale, 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 sale. And you're like, what did we order? And you're like, oh, I don't even remember. Oh, this is going to be fun. You get, like, this rush. You can get a rush from good things, too, by the way. Working out, you can get a rush from working out. That's how you know you really got a good workout, honestly. It's one of the ways. You feel better after you left than when you walked in. If you feel just as like down and junky as like you walked into the gym as you do when you left, or as you left when you walked in, you didn't get a good enough workout because you didn't get the dopamine and the serotonin rushing in your system enough. Right? Um, drugs will do this. Sex will do this. There's lots of things, both healthy and unhealthy, that gives you a rush of dopamine and serotonin. But in good ways, in healthy ways, that God created it. But it never replaces a relationship with Jesus. It never replaces a relationship with Jesus. Verse 20 and 21. But that isn't what you learned about Christ. Since you have heard about Jesus, you have learned the truth that comes from him. So you know better. You're a Christian. You're in church. We told this before. Verses 22 through 24. Throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes, starting with the Holy Spirit. Put on in your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Get rid of all the old stuff. Now remember, guys, this was written a couple thousand years ago, not by me. <laughs> not my rules, not my ways, not my standards. Brand new. Not a band-aid, not a cover-up, brand new. Here's the deal. This takes work. Because there is a fight in a battle for every single one of our souls. For my soul, for your soul, there's a battle. And the Apostle Paul is talking about a complete life change, a complete makeover, a whole different you. See, God just doesn't give you hope. God just doesn't bring you healing. God brings a whole new way of life. A whole brand new. Right? It's shedding your skin. Where right? the snake sheds its skin, when you see it well, it's like, it's the whole thing, it's the whole size, and it's just like, that thing is awesome. Right? It's a brand new skin. It's not sun. It's the whole thing. God's like, you've got to shed it. It's got to be completely brand new. And it means different things for different people. Maybe it does mean changing friends, hobbies, pastimes, activities, how we talk, how we think. Are we for people or against people? Are people for us or against us? How we spend money. Maybe you got to go home and delete a whole bunch of stuff from your computer. What is it? The question that I ask all is this, is what are you willing to do to make sure you don't go back to your old way of life? As we are about to enter into one year and the next, and like, this is who I want to become, what are you willing to do to make sure that you never, that you get rid of all the stuff that's going to put you back into the old way of life? What is God calling you to do? What is he calling you to do? If the old you, because if you really want to change and there's a brand new you, that means the old you wasn't working. Right? Understand that. That means you're like, it's not working. So why would you want to go back to something that's not working? 
whatever that is, what are you going to do to make sure you never fall back from that in the first place? I, I had this line, and I, just, I don't know who it's for, but it's this, royalty doesn't dumpster dive. Don't go back to your trash. You're royalty. You're co-heirs of the throne of God. You're royalty. Royalty dumps it, dumpster dives. Stop going back to the trash. If you're new in Christ, people should notice. Just be honest. People should notice. Right? If last Thanksgiving you showed up and you're 350 pounds. And this last January, we'll say January. Last January after the holidays, you stepped on the scale and you're 350. You're like, something's got to change. And you did it. And this Thanksgiving, you didn't see your family at all. And this Thanksgiving, you showed up and you're like, I am 199. You lost 150 pounds. Guess what? You show up, people notice. People notice. If you lost 150 pounds, people notice. Why? It's a whole new you. It's a whole new you. If you went from 350 to 345, you just skip breakfast. If all you do is come to church and add a little Jesus in you, you're just skipping breakfast. That's all. That's it. That's it. Don't just skip breakfast. Become a new you. What has to change? I don't know. There's, all, there's a whole bunch of things we're about to go through. But listen to me. Change happens first on the inside before it ever happens on the outside. Change will always happen with Christ on the inside before it ever happens on the outside. The world wants it to be the other way around. The church world even maybe wants it the other way around. They want you to talk different, look different, make decisions different first, and then let's work on the inside. It's easier that way. Your family may want it that way, right? As parents, we kind of want it that way if we're really honest with our kids, right? Like, it doesn't work that way. We work on the inside, and then the outside changes. So here's a bunch of things let's look through that Paul looks through. He says this in verse 25. It's all spelled out for me. Stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth. In other words, we're honest people. We're honest. We, and here's the deal. We don't just say technical truths. You know what I mean by this? Well, I didn't call Bob a jerk. I just said he was rude and inconsiderate. Right? Quit temper. I didn't call him a jerk. I didn't call him a, you know, whole. Like, I just simply said all these other things about him. I didn't really say that about so-and-so. I just said, you know, that's technical truth. I didn't say it. No, you just really implied it. Technical truths are lies done to try to persuade someone or something that isn't true. And we say things also with our actions, though, don't we? You don't just say you love your spouse or your kids or your parents or your siblings or your friends. You act like it. You act like it. We follow up with what we say. And here's, what, here's the, the tricky part about our mindset. If you're not seeing life correctly, it's a bad mindset, then you're going to have seen people's wrong actions towards you wrong. You're going to see things that aren't fair. So all this ends up flowing together. You're like, oh, but this person was mean. Were they? Did you say hi and you saw them flip you off and they really went like this and they gave you the bird instead and you just saw it too quickly? They went like this and you just saw one finger out of the things. You know what I mean? Like, you see how easy it is just to see something. Or somebody else just had to really, like, they had something else on their mind. So instead of stopping and talking to you on a Sunday morning, they just walked right by you. I can't believe they didn't talk to me. We had to have something else on their mind. They didn't even realize they were doing anything wrong. But in your mindset, because of a change of direction in your head, oh, something's something's not wrong. It's so we can do this really well. A new you is a truth teller, both with our words and our actions. Verses twenty six and twenty seven. Again, I never heard any of this. It says, and don't sin by letting your anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry, for anger gives the hope to the devil. Ooh. An initial emotional rush of anger is a natural response to things that happen. Holding on to it becomes bitterness. And angry, bitter people are not consistent with the Christian lifestyle. 
Don't, you don't control the impulse, but you do control what you do with that impulse. All right, so if you have this impulse of anger and it starts to rise up and you act out, okay. But 30 seconds later, you're still losing your ever-loving mind of some employee? That's not on you. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Like, that there's like, ha! Okay. Now you lose it, and you're just continuing losing it. That's, that, that's on you. Emotions are one thing. Actions are a whole other ball. Ooh, if you ever read that verse and go, should repent of that some stuff. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I've been there. Aren't you glad for Jesus' forgiveness? Because you read this, and by the way, when you read Ephesians, it puts Philippians 4.13 in a whole different context. For I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. <laughs> You're like, okay, yeah, that's a little different. I wish it meant, it meant I could deadlift 500 pounds, but I'll take this too. You know, like, okay. Because I read this, he says always and never and all these things like 100% stuff and you're just like, man, I'm not 100% that needs me. Yeah, we need Jesus. Because the old you is controlled by your emotions. The new you is self-control. The new you is self-control. Right, the last five years, social media really becoming big. It's gotten worse. Ten years, we'll say, COVID made it all the worse because we just shut everybody up and the only way we connect with ourselves is on the screens and empower people to say ridiculously horrible things about each other. Right, by the way, just, just a heads up, it's about to be an election year. Mm -hmm. I'll say this. Your candidate does not read your social media posts. Just remind yourself of that. Like, okay? They don't see it. They don't see it. They don't even write it them, they don't even write their own stuff themselves. So just, just remind yourself of that. But isn't it very interesting the last couple of years of people that have been attached? Politicians, police officers, pastors, doctors, nurses, teachers, kids, gas prices, anything you can think of has been targeted. Everything. Here's a bunch of scripture for you. Psalms 37, 8, and 9. Stop being angry. Turn from your rage. Do not lose your temper. It only leads to harm. For the wicked will be destroyed, but those who trust in the Lord will possess the land. Huh. James 1, 19 and 20. Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. You must be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. You must. Not you should, or to be a good person. You must. Human anger does not reproduce the righteousness God desires. Oh. We, Ecclesiastes 7, 9. Control your temper, for God angers. For God labels, for anger, labels you a fool. You know what? When we lose our temper, we lose. When I lose my temper, I lose. I lose. Again, anybody ever have to take, realize you read all this and go, man, I've got more L's than what I want to admit? Right? I'm about to ask you, so these questions, you ask some questions. Is it really effective? Right? Is getting angry and losing our mind really effective? Is presuming somebody against you or a group of people against you, is it helpful? Is having pre assumed ideas about something really helpful? You know, this issue about anger, I had to live this out, right? Ruby, uh, we take our kids a 16th birthday trip. They turn 16, they get a one, four or five day trip, one location, kind of turning from like childhood, adulthood, one thing. By the way, parents spend time with their kids. Take them to the grocery store with you. Like one-on-one -on -one time with kids. We have to figure out how to do this. We're always navigating it. I don't care if it's errands. I don't care if they want to go with you. Force them to go with you, sit up front in the car, jump around, like spend time with the kids. So Tina took Ruby and her herd. They wanted to go to Florida, so they went to Florida and they had their fun. Which means I have their other four kids and basketball practices and cooking and cleaning and all this stuff. And most of the time, when uh, most honestly, like 75% of Tina's trips are all paid for because she's got like, it's, it's work stuff. So when she's gone, I'm like, fun dad. I'm like, sweet, let's go, snacks, Oreos, party. Well, this wasn't like a two-day trip. I was like, yo, we can't do this. There's too much stuff going on, right? We got school, this, that. You can't stay up till midnight. We can't watch the movie. We can't tell Tina about it, boys. Like, you know what I mean? Like, all, that, all, all the stuff, right? Like, all the things. And so I had to, like, work this out as, like, what's really, is it really helpful? 
What's going to be really helpful? Because it's just you. What's going to really matter? What's going to really help make this week work and be a parent? And so, like, because you can't just stop parenting, stop teaching, stop directing, stop having rules. Like, hey, you got to have your room clean before you play Xbox. Like, just simple things. Those can't just go out the window because one person is gone. So how do you navigate these things? Are these things really helpful? All right? And a lot of times we think simple things are things that are good or bad. Or we may not be doing drugs, cheating on our spouses, but our mindset is hurting us. And seeing things that are not true can be just as dangerous. Our brain and how we think is our absolute biggest muscle. And it's the foundation of living a healthy, godly lifestyle. Right. I'll say, I'll, just, I'll admit this, you don't have to admit this, I've got a microphone, so I'll admit this. Family, I'm sorry, I probably, I've taken too many L's. Because honestly, scripture says that one is too many. Like, that's a little unrealistic. Yeah, they need Jesus. <laughs> Christian lifestyles are completely unrealistic to live without Jesus. Mm -hmm. The whole thing. Right. Like, I can't do it. That's the whole point. You need Jesus. So if I'm looking at the last 16 years or 15 years of marriage and parenting, have I ever been like, man, I've taken too many L's? I've taken too many L's. I am sorry. So every time we take a layer of Jesus off and put something else on that we used to wear, we lose in every situation. We lose when we see people, when ones that people see and ones that people don't, we lose no matter what. We lose when we do it, when we make decisions that are based out of fear rather than faith, we lose. We lose when those circumstances get to us and they make us angry and bitter and affects every other area of our life. We lose. We lose. See, problems are not personality driven. I'm Greek and Polish. Tina is like Scandinavian, German, and Russian. Our natural tendencies, mine's to raise my voice. Right? The whole big fat Greek wedding thing, that was like my grandparents to a T. <laughs> Tina is to shut down and like pull back. See, I don't need a microphone. Watch. See? Don't need it. Don't need it. Like, ever. I'm not loud. Like, I'm not even yelling. Like, to me, I'm just talking. Right? Yeah. Now, I'm raising my voice just a little. See what I mean? Like, I can get there real quick. Okay? Okay, it feels more than a little. Like, okay? <laughs> you see what I mean? I don't, I don't really, I can get there real quick. That's just, every, every, so growing up in Colorado, we came back to the Green Bay, Minneapolis area, see relatives, everything. Every single time. Every time. Aunts, uncles, grandparents, fighting. Every time. At least well, as a kid, we thought it was fighting. As you realize, they were all just Greek. To them, it was just a conversation. <laughs> It wasn't fighting, but they were all talking as loud as I just was. <laughs> like the whole weekend, and us cousins and the kids are like, dude, they're gonna swing. <laughs> no, they're not. They were just having a conversation within themselves, right? They were just that loud. That loud. They were just that loud. <laughs> but that's our natural tendency. So but I can't use, but I can't use that as an excuse. I can't use that as an excuse. I can't be like, well, I'm just loud. No, that's just stupid. I can't use my natural tendencies because I'm not, there's no Greek, no Jew, no Greek, no Gentile. I can't use my tendencies for being a jerk. Well, oh, I'm just Greek. No, you're just a jerk. <laughs> like, you know, like, I can't use that as an excuse. No, so no matter what your natural tendencies to yell, scream, or pull back, it's not an excuse. Why does naturally pull back? No, now you're just non existent. So you can do it both ways. The only thing I can blame is a lack of self-control. Like, that's it. The only thing I can blame, lack of self-control. On both sides, because it's self-control to stay and not like and not check out, and it's a lack of self-control not to lose your temper either. Both sides. By the way, the fruit of the spirit is simply there to show others how much Jesus has changed your life. And it keeps going, but we're, we're not done yet. Aren't you excited? <laughs> Verse 28. If you are a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good work. And then give generously to need to those and others. Give generously to others in need. The old you is a taker. You gotta get mine. I deserve this. The government should help me there. Blah blah blah. I'm owed this. It's all about me, 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 me. The new you is about what I what I can give. 
Isn't that interesting that he says the opposite of stealing isn't not taking. The opposite of stealing is working and giving. That was the direct correlation here. It wasn't just not to take something. He's directly correlating stealing to working and giving. That's the opposite. We have dulled, we have dulled morality down so much that as long as you don't actually take something, steal, so like walk out without paying it from, from the grocery store, like I didn't steal anything. But Paul goes, no, no, no. Second thing, quit stealing, work, give to others. That's the opposite. People who have Jesus are generous. They're generous with their time, money, possessions, attention. They share everything about their life. Everything. Verse 29, we'll continue so we can get out of here. Don't use foul or abusive language. <laughs> Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. We've all watched that one. Like, not any? Don't use foul language. Let everything you say be good and helpful. Everything? Like, even the dad jokes? Everything? Everything be good and helpful? By the way, my dad jokes are helpful because you laugh. Okay. <laughs> My kids may roll their eyes more than they laugh, but at least I thought they were funny, so they're helpful to me. I'm just trying to make myself feel better, okay? Okay, remember, this is written to Christians. Not not Christians. There's a difference for how Christian, Christians are supposed to conduct themselves and how other people conduct themselves. Even though you go, yeah, but that's not my experience. I know, we'll get to that in a second. The new you builds people up and does not tear them down. The new you builds people up, the old you tears them down. Useless words are replaced with useful and encouraging words. People notice it. People notice it. People of Jesus are aware of their words. Remember the old phrase, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. I don't even know if they say that in school. I kind of wish. It'd be better than the language they say now. All these made up words that I don't know anything about. I'm like, what are you talking about? What the heck? Wrist? Like, what? Like, just. I realize how old you You know you're old when you're at that point in life and you're complaining about the things that kids say. You're like, oh crap, I am there. I am my parents. <laughs> yep. Yep. Okay. Okay. I'm old. Proverbs 18.21 says this, The tongue can bring death for life. Those who love to talk will reap the consequences. As I'm standing on the stage talking for the last half an hour. Oof. Words can hurt, words can heal. Words can bring hope, words can crush dreams. Words can do damage or destroy, or words can bring you up, bring you confidence. Bullies and jerks use the self-worth of others to destroy it, honestly, because theirs has been destroyed. Christian, use words to build each other up because their self-worth is in a God who loves them and cares about them. That's a big difference. You see somebody, you see these kids in school or people on social media who just love to rip everybody apart. Their self-worth has been destroyed, who they are. They need Jesus. And they're just taking out on everybody else. They need Jesus. Psalms 19, 14 says this. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord. You are my rock and my redeemer. May your words and thoughts be pleasing to God. Ooh, what a barometer to ask yourself. In the upcoming months, maybe just months, as you're looking at like changing things and tweaking things, what do you want to accomplish? Put Psalms 1914 and go, Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation, the things I think about in my heart be pleasing to you. You're my rock, you're my redeemer. Honestly, if the church of Christians get this at, get this right, I think everything changes. A lot changes. Imagine that every person who calls themselves a Christian on social media follows this. Let everything I say, let everything I think about be pleasing to the Lord. You know the average person says seven hours a day on their cell phone? Seven hours a day? That's the person, not teenager. Person. Here's a question. I, 
I was debating about even asking it this morning. I was like, nope, I'm going to do it. Is the reason why we see so many students and young people are so disrespectful to authority figures, teachers, coaches, pastors, police officers, is it because they watch the model of disrespect to authority from their own authority figure? Seriously. You want to see kids who treat teachers wrong? Where do you think it comes from? Listen, my kids are far from perfect, but I'll brag on them a little bit. Every single teacher they've ever had, from GLW, Florida, to the middle school, to the high school, praises my kids in public. Now, granted, they've got plenty of but I don't put them on a pedestal. They are normal kids. They've said jokes they shouldn't have said. They've done things they shouldn't have said. They probably said things to you they shouldn't have said. But my goodness, they will respect authority. I think part of it is this, is throughout all the stuff, it's governing levers. It's President Obama, it's President Bush, it's President Trump, it's President Biden. It's not let's go Brandon, it's President Biden. Mm -hmm. There's a respect to authority that has to happen. It has to happen. Can you imagine, here's what I was thinking about, can you imagine if God was said, you know, God just come down and goes, here's the deal. I'm going to start regulating social media to every Christian. The first time, you get kicked off for five days. Second time, 15. Third time, a month. The fourth time, you're just kicked off completely. If it doesn't follow Psalms 1914. <laughs> Half of Christians will be kicked off real fast. See, five days, 15, that's 20. A month, that's 50. I bet you within 60 days. <laughs> There's a lot of so-called pastors or just politicians that be kicked off. And look what he drops in verse 30. So Paul just continues this thing. He's just continuing talking. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Oof. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. Saying, don't sorrow the Holy Spirit. God's called you as his own. You are a priest. You are a royal priesthood. Guaranteeing your salvation when I come back. Promising, guaranteeing, signed, sealed, delivered. It is a stamp and a label. So don't do it. Here's what an author had to say about it. He says, all sin is painful to God. But sin in his children breaks his heart. When his children refuse to change the ways of the old life for the ways of the new, God is grieved. It's heartbreaking. You ever been dumped or rejected? And that feeling in your heart, that pit in your stomach that just made you feel like a complete worthless. That's how God feels when he sees you. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh. At least that's what I got out of it. And then Paul reminds him, he continues on. Get rid of all your bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil, evil behavior. Anybody have any of those uh, people that are legalistic? I got a couple of those kids. One of them is really good, because I'll say things like this. I'll try to be nice. Hey, I think it might be a great idea to watch it. Well, could you, like, maybe go clean your room? Hey, could you maybe, like, pick up downstairs? Could you do this? And I'll come downstairs 30 minutes later. Basement's still destroyed. I'm like, wait a minute, I asked you if you could. He's like, no, you said, could I? I'm like, <laughs> remember the temper? Just, <laughs> right? Like, could you? Oh, that's, been, that's a nice way of me telling you to do it. You know what I mean? Like, so if you're out here and you're like, well, you didn't tell me not to exactly do this and this and this. Yeah, legalistic part. You didn't tell me there's no more excuses. No more excuses. He's saying you're done with your old way of life. Completely done. Not just a little done. Verse 32. Instead, be kind to each other. Tenderhearted. Forgiving one another. Just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. Remember all the crap you've been through? Remember all the junk that you did? Remember how much I forgave you? Okay, forgive everybody else. Even Jesus told us the disciples, and the disciples were like, how many times should I forgive somebody? He's like, oh, 70 times 7? A day? Sure, every day. They're like, I don't want to do that every day. 490 times every day, somebody stabs you in the back, you're supposed to forgive them that many times every single day, every day for the rest of your life. <laughs> yeah, I don't like that either. Again, God's ways are not easy. It's a whole new way of operating in life. All new ways. 
fear, home, school, work, everywhere. When you really experience God's forgiveness, you realize it extends to others. You're like, man, God forgave me. I'm the worst of these. That's why Paul said, he's like, I'm the worst of all. I'm the worst of all. See, the big picture of new me is this. New me, the self-controlled truth teller who generally who generously shares with others, who builds people up, kind, compassionate, and forgiving. You want to know what Christians should be like? In this section, let's coach self-control, truth teller, generously shares everything about their lives with other people, doesn't hold back, builds people up, kind, compassionate, forgives others. That would be a great place to start. How much would that co-worker stand out? How much would that co-worker stand out? How much would that sibling stand out over the holidays? That family stand out over the holidays? How much would that church stand out? That's what the church is known for. That's what a body group of people said. This is what we're going to be known by. That's what they're known by. Oh, that's different. Because that's not what most people think of the church. How many people would want Jesus if that's what Christianity as a whole would look like? People should be able to know it's the difference between you and Christians and how we act and talk. Yeah. Yeah. They should be able to notice the difference. The principle is this. Jesus on the inside transforms us on the outside. If you're looking at all this and going, oh, I really struggle with it, that's fine. It means you just need to be more Jesus. Jesus on the inside transforms us on the outside. If you're looking at your life and go, man, I don't, I'm not forgiving enough. I'm a little judgmental. I got some resentment I need to get rid of. I'm a little angry, a little bitter, a little hurtful. It means there's some stuff on the inside that God wants to work out. That's what it means. There's some stuff on the inside that God wants to work out. Now let me say this real fast before I pray. You don't need to love Jesus to attend this church. I'll personally make sure that people are loving, kind, compassionate <clears throat> to you. But make no mistake about it, it doesn't change God. His whole desire is that you shall be there. You should come to know a personal relationship with him. That's why people should be kind and compassionate and loving and caring. Mm -hmm. So they do see it played out in real life. That's their goal. And just because somebody attends this church or you see them in public or used to, doesn't mean Jesus isn't in their life. We've all had good days and we've all had bad days. It's not about attending a church, it's about loving Jesus. So yeah, you can have your struggles. You're always going to be welcome and anybody and everybody is always going to be welcome. But it's never going to change the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why it's great to walk through a book like this because I don't get to pick and choose topics. Like, well, he chose that topic. I didn't choose the topic. It's like the topics were chosen for me. No matter what it says, I just got to go off of it. That's it. Everybody, no matter their lifestyle, no matter their background, no matter what they're going through, is and will always be welcome as long as I'm the one standing in the pulpit preaching. But it'll never, ever change the gospel of Jesus Christ and the life that he wants to give us. And the things that we got to tweak and change because it is a whole new life. It is an all new skin. It is a whole new wardrobe. It isn't a band-aid, it isn't a cover-up, is it adding a little bit of Jesus to this and not changing anything? Everybody has to change their life when you come to Jesus. You want to change it because all that is done for your life. Jesus on the inside transforms us on the outside. I beg you this, don't make your decision about following Christ or Christianity based on what other people do. There's a lot of people who don't talk and act and they say they love Jesus, but you look at their life and you're like, is that ever exchange? Mm -hmm. Don't make decisions. Read scripture for yourself. Like, this is what God, I want. I want this. I want Jesus. But I have to be honest. What is growing on the inside is also seen on the outside. It is. So it's reflective in how we talk about people, to our families, how we love people, how we handle our anger, how we handle our finances. All of it's reflective. Jesus on the inside changes us on the outside. So as we meet, we've gone along the way. What type of work needs to be done on the inside so people can see the change on the outside?
I don't know if they do. I've given us a whole bunch of stuff to look at today. I told you, I sat down at about 7.15. I was in a third row sitting right there. Thirty three years ago, okay, God, what type of work needs to be done on me on the inside so that you can make sure that you make the difference on the outside? We're human beings with ebbs and flows. There is a real devil, and he doesn't want you to succeed. And he will fight you against it. And he'll come up with every excuse, and he'll get into our heads, and he'll say all sorts of stuff. Because eternity is at stake. All he cares about is restoring your eternity. Let's pray. Lord, you know each one of our hearts. You know where all the hidden things and all the visible things are. You see it all. You know everything that others would say that needs to change. You know the things that nobody else does as well. Despite it all, you love us and you died and rose from the dead so that we can be forgiven. So Lord, I ask you to show each one of us what we need to do to be forgiven from what needs to change on the inside so people can see the change on the outside. What type of healing needs to happen? What type of past wrongs do we need to let go of and forgive? Where do we need to exercise more patience in so many different things? Lord, you know them all. And we ask that you bring conviction to our soul so that we can draw to you, repent, and be changed. We can turn towards the Savior who loves us so much. Lord, we thank you for your words in Ephesians chapter 4, your scripture, that we get so many lessons to take with us. Lord, I pray that this would not be the only time that we look at this this week. Help us to dive back into this ourselves. Let us use it in our own personal lives. And because we know that when we use scripture, your scripture is alive and active. And we know that if we use it in our personal lives, it can and it will change us. Let it open us up to who you want us to be. Let us forgive the people that we need to forgive and live a life that you have called us to live. We thank you for loving us even when we have failed to do this. Your love for us never changes. You never deny us. You never let us go. You love us despite us reading this and going, I've got too many options. Help us to have a lot more dead ends this week, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless, guys. I hope you have an absolute fantastic week. We will see you later. Go get your kids before Mr. Matt sells them all. <laughs>